an email came in today. Y- you familiar with this method of communication? I believe I am well versed in emails coming in, not just Turns out at any time of day, but all times of day. I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Where? Where is it? See, this is how much I'm scrolling. You're you're seeing this unfold in real time. This is the emails that have come today. <laughs> Goodness. All right. I'd like to compare the volume of emails. Yeah, we should. You set up a, can you do a thing where you count like how many emails came today? Today? If you just do a search and you just say like Well, I today, can just tell you right? because I try to clear and out you... my uh, my project emails Mm-hmm. On a daily mm-hmm. basis, and currently mm. my wow. in, okay, and currently you. one project has one hundred sixty-two emails. Just one project, just one project, and then the other yeah. project has real-time update fifty-eight. I I just in in my mail uh, I just in the search box I typed today, which then allows me to choose today as the date I have. 263 263 that's r- r- ridiculous it's ridiculous and and i had oh. i did a recording earlier with a a guy who he he's worked at several large firms and he uh, you know one of one of my goals is to expose what it's actually like to work in the practice of architecture kind of like what we do on this podcast yeah and in in that episode we're really just talking about technology adoption or mm-hmm. lack thereof, as it may be. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if firm leadership, again, I'm I always coming at this from like the large firm perspective because yeah. that's my experience. So your mileage may vary. But <laughs> how come you're not using latest, greatest tool? It's because I'm drowning in freaking email and I have yeah. to deal with email. Like if, if your leadership knew how much time you're spending in email every day, I would... I'd love to know what they think about that. So, <laughs> because gonna, it's r- ridiculous. I'm going to turn my monitor on here. So, um, okay. Uh, and here's a here's a quote from a fellow compatriot. Who? Let's see what was his exact. He's like, comrade. Is, is that, this is how the email is, begins. He is. <laughs> Is your slash my life just a series of meetings um, mm. without the 30 minute snack break in between? <laughs> Remember and, when COVID started and it was just back to back virtual meetings? Oh, yeah. And there was, there was never even room for a bathroom break. <laughs> and, and yes, yes. <laughs> and that. I believe is what has set off this precedence of the boundary list adventure in how well, we we've talked about. You the, can't even the say it, can you? Exa- well, we we've we've talked about the different feeds that we kind of follow, and I right. probably haven't sent this one to you, but we were looking at one where there was this guy who was he's a career coach. And so he was reading real emails that he receives from clients, basically talking about emails that they receive from their bosses and, or exchanges of that. It's like, Hey, I need you to come in on such and such a time, or I need you to answer this email. And the exchange back and forth is, but it's two o'clock on a Saturday. And it's just like, well, and, and they went on to say that, oh, you millennials and it was specifically about he he's a career coach that kind of specializes in kind of like the the youth of today or mm-hmm. the younger the younger working professionals and, emerging yes and and so he he's basically kind of exposing what you and I've talked about on numerous occasions about this this issue that we've created throughout our careers, but it, it's systemic to like all of the different professions specifically in America, yeah. but you know, it, it, I'm sure it happens elsewhere, but you know, talking about, well, 
the older generations, whenever they were asked to do work, they just did it. They didn't complain about it. They just did it. And, you know, and so you just which kinda, led to the, the abuse, which led to the abuse and all of that other stuff. And so when you see things like this, or when we talk about like COVID and the availability that we had digitally, it has never stopped. You know, it's never, I, I received an email from someone on Sunday asking me, they're like, oh, I've got a meeting early tomorrow. Is there any way that you can get me this information? Like, did you know that you were going to have this meeting early tomorrow? Could you yeah, have asked so, me maybe so the... Friday or Thursday or, you know, I, 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 I am only assuming. Now, internally, I usually basically tell them, hey, you're waiting on, wait until Monday. And this was an internal one. Um, clients, I have been known to abuse or, or relax that rule and, and just answer theirs. But now it's getting to the point where, when do you say, Hey, boundaries, I mean, don't, you know, shouldn't you be taking Saturday off or Sunday off? Yeah, it's good. I read a book called rework maybe 10 years ago and it was, it, it was a bunch of really short essays about work. And it had some some to do with just like this topic that we're talking about right now, which is this whole idea of ASAP. Mm -hmm. And uh, the author, one of the authors, it was co-authored by two people, uh, both of whom work in the tech side of things at, at a company called 37 Signals, also known as Basecamp. They uh, they wrote that book and sent out an email today. They it just oh, The timing is perfect, so I have to bring <laughs> it up. And it was about that essay in the book and the culture of ASAP and what it and how it needs to die. Because if you yeah. have oh, a yeah. culture of ASAP and that is what it takes for somebody to say to get something done, how do you prioritize anything? How does anything become a priority in right. a world of ASAPs? Right? It, it's impossible. And so then how do you actually pay attention to the things that actually matter, not just the things that somebody else's piss poor performance yeah. right or lack yeah. of planning leads to a quote unquote urgent need and it's just because it's your urgent need doesn't mean it's my urgent need right to, had, to respond we we started off talking about emails and volumes of emails and things like that we're still yeah so, we're going so, deep <laughs> so i had four emails today that were urgent emails that needed to be responded to, or at least that was with the red flag on them. That was the red flag. They're like urgent that with the, with the exclamation point. Yeah. Stated in the email body and all of that other stuff. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so I had them and I opened them all up and I kept bouncing back and forth between trying to answer a little bit of this one, a little bit of that one. And had, there was too, there was too much, there were the request that they had, required so much more information as part of the response that it wasn't an ASAP. It wasn't a, I need you to get this to me. I'm going to send it to you at 6 a.m. and I need it by 7 a.m. In this, so this ASAP really does need to be something that's prioritized. If it is something that is, is of, of an emergency, you probably knew about it ahead of time. I mean, if it's something that, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh. Okay. If it's a roof collapsing, okay, that's one thing. If it's something that's just like, I need information about this specific area within a building, or you were working on this design. I just wanted to ask you questions about this one because we've got a meeting in two days, which was one of the emails. And I need you to respond to some of these questions that people have. Okay. Well, guess what? I'll get to them when I get to them and I will answer when I can answer. But if you want the right answer, if you want the informed mm -hmm. answer, it can't be ASAP. Right. It, right. it, it has to well, be prioritized to be a properly, you know, something that's crafted, that's accurate. Critically accurate response. It, yeah. Exactly. And I, I feel like the idea of not knowing what's on your plate and not, so the way you said that, you, you I said don't want Terry. people to take that as, <laughs> You, you said, all right, you're, you're not going to get a response from me. And it's not out of lack of interest or it, or duty. It's, it's, you can't provide the right 
kind of quality answer without your due diligence. And, so, and for you to drop what you're doing, which they have no clue about, and have a complete lack of empathy to even ask if there's room in your day for this thing, right? It, it, it's, it's, it sounds like entitlement coming from you, but it's really entitlement coming from the asker. Yeah. So I, I'll tell you even, uh, I'll go a little bit deeper into this, that the queries that came from this email was in response to an RFI that I asked um, because we're we're doing some additional work that was started by another firm that we've assumed that. And so there is a bit of like liability and responsibility for them to provide some of the information that they've already created uh, without going too deep into it. So I asked a question, right? They gave me a response. They wanted me to respond back to that response, but that response had 32, three, two, 32 sub questions within it. it. And they wanted a response to every one of those 32 questions. So, okay, I can give you it, but it's not ASAP. I right. can give, I, I like, you're asking me technical questions about technical things that need a, a well thought out response, quite mm -hmm. possibly responses from whether it be the manufacturer, whether it be my engineers, whether it be other architects within the company working on the project. It's not just a, oh, I'll just go ahead and turn this around immediately. And, and they right. even responded back to me. Again, this is in response to me asking them a question. And then them basically giving me back nothing and then me pushing back to them and say, nothing isn't a viable response. I need actually more information. I need more detail. And so then rather than them giving me the detail that I asked for, they asked 32 additional questions, which then prompts me to give them detail to ask them to give me detail. Uh, Yeah. The beatings will continue until morale improves. This episode is made possible with support from Chaos Enscape. This is the perfect time to set good intentions and resolutions for the months ahead. Whether you aim to solve your design challenges faster, run your projects more smoothly, make quicker decisions, or share immersive walkthroughs with the click of a button, here's some good news. You won't need any resolutions. Chaos Enscape has the best 3D workflow solution. Chaos Enscape is the industry-leading real-time visualization plugin that is 100% fast, 100% easy, and fully integrated into your favorite design tools. It is the trusted choice of over 500,000 monthly users across 150 countries. Starting today, you can get a 20% discount on fixed and floating annual licenses. Just head to chaos-enscape.com and use code RES24 at checkout. That's chaos-enscape.com using code RES24 at checkout to supercharge your design workflow. Thanks to Chaos Enscape so much for their support of this episode. And now let's get back to the conversation. Speaking of email, I mean, we should probably get out of this deep, dark Yes, please. Get me out of here. Place. We were sent an email... I don't know that the outcome of the following part of our conversation will be any better, <laughs> but let's see what happens. <laughs> we received a listener email and uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to share the name, so I will not. Okay. But uh, it says, we just listened to your latest episode and congrats on 12 years, which, you know, let's high five, go for it. One, two, three, high five. And uh, I've been listening more and more over the past year and love your content. I have one question. Given the discussion about AI, okay, time to put on your thinking cap. Uh -oh. Would you still enter into the architecture field given where AI might go into the future? It's interesting. If, if you and were, let's go back. You have, to, you have to go back into your, how, how old were you when you decided to become an architect? Or let, even just go into school? Well, it's, different because when I decided to, that I wanted to pursue architecture was when I was in elementary school, watching the construction yeah. of the Pontiac Silverdome and didn't even know no what architecture yeah. was all about. 
yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's a that's a different conversation in its own. <laughs> did you know when you went into college? Because I didn't. <laughs> I did. I did. I had. I. I thought I did. I was way wrong. <laughs> I, I I knew. Now, did I know what it meant? <laughs> did I did I know what I was expecting? No, but did I know? I I had been on this pursuit for a very long time, and so yes, I would have gone. And so I guess and, we just and, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of of the the people of today. So I look at it is in two brains when I answer this is like if I had the tools then that we have now, would I have still gone into architecture? And I would say yes. And the reason I would say yes is I would be excited to be able to explore architecture in a completely different fashion. Now, you and I have been, you know, talking about um, AI. We were talking about, what is it, the, the Apple, the goggles, what are the Apple yeah, Vision the Pro? the Apple Vision Pro. Yes. yes, so the Apple Vision Pro and all of the different doors that all of this will be able to open in the hopefully not so distant future. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about how your toolbox, if you were to do architecture now or start your own firm, that your toolbox yeah. would be completely different from the toolbox of kind of the conventional firms. Right. A and I, I feel that r right now I'm answering it based off of what I've experienced in the past and what I see coming because I see an excitement of a change in the profession, whether it's by architects or by people outside of architecture, that is really going to make architecture exciting. But if I were to say, not knowing any of the things that I know about architecture now, I would have been ignorant to all of my past and probably still would have pursued it because I had a conversation today and we were talking about the five senses and how the five senses influence memory, influence all sorts of different things, ex influence experience, and how, if anything, architecture responds to those five senses. And, and in a way, yeah, <laughs> we were talking, he, was, he goes, well, how does, how does taste come into it? I'm like, I'm not really talking about like licking a wall or anything, but I gave him an example because he and I were on a project together and we were walking in the sub basement. So the utility tunnels of this one project that we have in, in, in Baltimore and the overwhelming smell of moisture of mildew to me. Bad not, things. O not only could I <laughs> smell it, but I could taste it. And you have sin, you have synesthesia. You know what that is? Yeah. yeah. It's when you can like taste colors and yeah. <laughs> oh, don't make me start singing. I can hear flavors. Yeah. Don't, I can hear flavors. Yeah. Don't make me start singing <laughs> some of uh, Gene Wilder's um, Willy Wonka. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, but, but so, but anyway, so. What, what I, where I was going with that is that there is a way for us to be able to take architecture even further than we've imagined in kind of our 2D pencil sketches kind of way that in concept we've never been able to do before, ever in the history of architecture. And I'm really excited about that. Now, I'm also kind of depressed because I'm not going to be around for a lot of that. Like, I may mm. be alive, but I'm probably not going to be in the profession at that time. <laughs> or... What do you mean by or, around? You know, like mentally? Yeah. <laughs> but you mean, I, may not, I may not be here anymore. <laughs> but I'm actually really excited about in whether or not at my advanced experience i mean age i mean years uh, whatever it is that i am same thing yeah i am going to put myself through like the learning 
of this stuff and, and actually like teach myself how to use, how, how to experience architecture through Apple Vision Pro or something thereof, eh, you know, I mean, that's, that's to be, that's who knows, who knows where we're going with that. But, but I am really, really excited about the opportunities that AI, the opportunities that this, what is, you, you know, better than I do, what is, um, Apple Vision Pro, like what, what kind of computing mm -hmm. is that? Spatial. Spatial computing. Thank you. Oh. Yep. Yep. Oh. <laughs> and, and so I'm really excited about where all of that is going. And mm -hmm. I, you know, you more than me, I'm, I'm curious about how you would answer that, especially since you are far more tech savvy than I probably will ever be. So I'm curious where you. I, I've always, I feel like I've always had the position of being excited about the future of our profession. And that just keeps going, right? Like I'm, and I'm kind of wired that way anyway. I'm always thinking about what's next. I'm not really thinking even about what's now or where, what has been. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I've always kind of lived in the future and I don't have any like great predictions or anything. That's not what I mean. I right. just mean like I can see the potential and I can see, and, and yet there are so many roadblocks. It's, it's funny because we look at this question where it talks, it, it basically paints a picture that like, this is inevitable. This is going to happen. Hmm. Number one, we don't know that that's true. AI will affect every single industry out there. It seems sure. that that really does. That's how I feel right now, but to different levels and different extents and, and to different depths and meaning Adoption is a lot slower in some than others. Uh, some are, it's much more applicable in some ways than others. Um, I, I'm I'm always interested in the convergence or the overlap in different technologies too. So if we look at the Vision Pro and we look at AI, and if we overlay those on top of each other, what does that mean? Right. right. That means something different than just looking at them independently because these things are not working independently. They are starting to get wired together as we speak. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been excited about the future. And that's why I've always been kind of a cheerleader of technology and architectures, because I do see that, that amazing potential. And, but again, going back to my comment a minute ago about the roadblocks, like adoption is slow and recognizing that we are off, we are often chasing the shiny lure or the shiny right. thing. And that is not at the root of our problems. That's not actually solving the root of our problems. And that is often a distraction from solving the root of our problems. Right. We look busy because we're chasing this, this vision, but the fundamentals aren't actually shifting. They're not shifting fast enough, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, what's funny is if I even go even going back to school, like we went back, you went back to your youth, we went back to school, like we didn't. We only saw the potential then too. Right. We didn't see right. all the problems, right. right? We didn't understand what it was like to go through the years it takes to do a project or the convincing that you have to do or the AHJs you have to deal with or the codes you have to deal with or the value engineering or the long hours or the low pay or, you know, the you never be being recognized at the ribbon cutting ceremony or at the groundbreaking yeah. ceremony. Like there's all these things that are kind of symptoms of something way, uh, that's a way bigger problem, right? right? And the, the toxic work environments or the toxic cultures or the toxic people. And uh, there, there's so many things in both columns. There's like the really great stuff. There's, there's the medium stuff. And then there's like the really bad stuff. Right. And I tend to just look at the really great stuff. I tend to, there's, there's a lot of people who are constantly pointing out the negative things that need to be dealt with. They're, they're coming right. at it from a critical point of view saying, and we've done that plenty on this podcast as well, right? Which is oh, yeah. like, we should be way better than this. We, the royal we, the, the profession should be better at this. Um, and oftentimes we're just waiting for the, the older generations to die. And I, I, 
getting there myself, people. Like, and I realized like there's there's plenty of people in younger generations who are already curmudgeons, right? They it didn't even take long to get there. Yeah, yeah. But but oftentimes we like just the decks do need to get cleared. What if you could start from scratch? What if you could design it again? What if you could start over? Like knowing what we know now is the current situation still the right path? And I don't think it is, but at the same time, could we actually wholesale swap it out for a better model? I don't think so, right? Like right, right. we need to actually address these problems because just like working on a project, 99% of it gets thrown away because we're learning through that experience, right? right? And we right. go with the, f and that needs to happen in this too, but we have to acknowledge out loud that like this isn't working, so we're going to scrap this piece and we're going to redo it. We could only do that by living it, you know, by by actually making that decision and and pursuing going forward with it. Right. Um, so to answer the question, like I absolutely would. I think the potential is greater than ever for people to truly understand the yeah. value of s what space can do. Yeah. Of what true architecture, not buildings, not just commoditized design, not just generic spaces, but actual architecture can do for the health and well-being of people and the way that they can contribute back to society because of the the technology advancements that make it uh available to them to do that without having to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to actually build a building <laughs> right so right right i mean i th i think the potential is better than it ever has been to for for us to connect the dots between what the value of what we do is and tangibly being able to have somebody have that experience with relatively no cost or barrier to entry. Yeah. I think that that's a, yeah. but you have to learn how to use the tools. You have to learn how to communicate. You have to learn, you have to learn how to connect with people and build trust and relationships and make it, a, it's still a very human to human experience to walk down it's, that path and get there. Yeah. Because we're still going to be the filters of understanding what you can and can't do with some of the things that we ask AI to do. I mean, you know, like just to put it in a real perspective of a project, we, we've got a project where, you know, and you've heard me say this on some of the more recent episodes, where when we're talking about this kind of like redoing some spaces within a thing and and I'm there kind of like telling everybody, okay, well, we can explore this, but we've got to take a look at what the building can do and, and all of this others. We are still those filters. We're still the ones that have to like say, okay, we can look at like different materials that, you know, on a, on a very quick iterations here and there, but we've got to think about like the, the cost of the materials and all of the other little things that we've got to do to, to kind of make it work. And so we're, Everybody who's worried about AI kind of like taking architects jobs away, it's not that that's going to happen. It's more that, as we've said countless times, you know, it's those architects who aren't using AI and not every one of the clients, current clients right now are going to be expecting an architect to come in there with their little kit of parts, with their computer and their goggles and all of this other stuff. And walk through it. They're going to want to have, you know, sit down at a dining room table and do the sketches and all of that other stuff. But as we continue to evolve into those daily use of the technology and the people who we're going to be interacting with in clients, they are going to have a different set of expectations. And those expectations need to be met by the people who are going to be the ones who understand how to put buildings together, understand the spatial coordinations of programs and needs and budgets and all of these other things. And so we aren't going to outmode ourselves, but we are going to outmode ourselves if we don't know how to harness the power of the future that's come. It's, it's the next evolution of tools. Right. And for thousands Absolutely. of years, humans have been using tools yeah. to apply leverage in the various use usefulness of that tool. And that, that can be a digital tool. It can be a physical tool. I'm a lover of all things, right? When it right. comes oh, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to tools, like I, I have a, I like to make things physically. I like to make things digitally. I think it's absolutely incredible the tools yeah. that we have available to us to make that happen. But 
it is an inherently human experience to inhabit space. Mm -hmm. AI does not understand that at all. Right. Right. And don't don't for a minute think that it does. Right. Like it doesn't understand so many things about how we connect emotionally to th when tangibles or intangibles as the word space Ab may absolutely. actually be more closely related to right the quality of of a void in in the world or an enclosure i mean it maybe is a better way to put it i think is an absolutely weird thing and here we are this is what we do right we we envelop space with when i was having that conversation today with a few coworkers and i was waxing poetic about the emotion the emotions that is evoked by architecture I mean, that's where we bring that that's where we can master our storytelling i mean mm -hmm. whether we use ai to kind of help facilitate some of that storytelling we're still the storytellers we're still the ones who will be able to um have explain the emotional connection the sensory connection all of these different connections to the place that people are asking us to create right yeah i don't but I, if it and if it and not but if it's a tool that you can use to communicate that more effectively yeah yeah why wouldn't why wouldn't you you know when we when we say okay think in your mind's eye and then you start like mm -hmm. you know telling them like all of these different things, what we're doing is we're giving them prompts, right? To think mm -hmm. about <laughs> all of that. So if we're giving them the, pro the prompts of like, say a sketch, like we show them a sketch and we're like, well, think about this. Now think about this on a misty day, the fog rolling in and all these other things. Well, guess what? We can take that sketch and we can create a misty day with the fog rolling in through AI generation that can give them this kind of feeling that we're trying to evoke on a warm spring day with the sunlight dappling through the this and it'll be dancing along the facade and you, we just start the the things that we can help them imagine the the evolution of a building throughout the year throughout the ages like you know how how will we age with this building and things like that just i just look at it and like I'm kind of excited about being able to expand our tools of storytelling. Yeah. It's interesting, right? Because it, it the idea of technology in the last 10 years has been to democratize tools, which means mm -hmm. everybody has access to them. And I think what's interesting is, you know, the early adopters are very interested in how they can use these tools as a differentiator amongst their peers or competition right. in the market. But that's not the goal of the technology. The technology is to gain scale as quickly as possible, which means yeah. as many users as possible, which means everybody has access to said tools for whatever the price is that the, the supply and demand economics work out. Right. Yeah. And so if everybody has access to the same tools, like all the firms use Revit or Archicad, all everybody uses SketchUp or Rhino. Everybody has access to Enscape and you know rendering visualization apps and Veris, and they're they're looking at tools like Midjourney and they're looking at tools like Ch they're using ChatGPT or they're using Microsoft Office 365. It's connecting all these different applications together to create present. It's like guess what? Everybody's got the same tools. Now what's your differentiator? Right. It's not the tools, people. It's the people, people. It's the people. That's what. And so, it you you do need to learn enough to be dangerous. I I, I like that terminology. I think we should be way more dangerous in yeah. the kinds of ideas that we explore, in in air quotes, because we need more good architecture. We need more great architecture. Yeah, that does not happen by just chasing the status quo, right? So. In order to do that, if you if you do you, I do advocate for learning these tools enough to be dangerous mm -hmm. early, but also understanding that everybody has access to the same tools that you do. I mean, and so really, it comes down to your appetite for experimentation, and if you get value out of that. So, it's not that I'm even specifically talking about AI, right? I'm just talking about the right whatever the tool is right. of right. of right. the day. It could it could be 
it, you could name any category in AEC tech and the same the same sentiment would would apply right so um anyway i don't know where i was really going with that other than like like you you've got to figure out where the value is for you and if there's no value fine ditch it move yeah. on revisit it later right. it will get better i guarantee you we're watching how fast everything's developing if the apple vision pro headset is not for you today at $3500 the next version might be, and you're gonna you're gonna want to watch the development right. so that you're not surprised by it when your competitors are using it to their advantage, right. and you're like, "Huh, I wonder how that happened." Well, yeah. you weren't paying attention, right? So, um, th this is all I think really great conversation to be having because I do feel like there are people who would be like, first of all, there's always been people in architecture who would be like, "Would you do it again?" No way, I would do something way more. Yeah. Fill in the blank. Profitable, exactly. Uh, Work-life balance, uh, <laughs> satisfying, whatever the thing might be. Yeah. Um, but I'm still like in love with the foundational thing that architecture does for society. I mean, that to me yeah. is something that is for the few. It's not for the many, right? And there's a huge need for buildings, and I think more so than ever, we have a a huge need for architecture to actually solve problems and and the challenges that are rising today ever since i bit the apple i don't think that i've ever thought about going back and doing something doing else. something else and i've done a lot yeah. of things but this is like the thing that still brings me joy that is ingrained as a part of who i am i drop my daughter off at school and I drive around the town that we live in and there are so many different eras of architecture and we're talking about great architecture. We're not talking about good architecture or okay architecture. We're talking about great architecture and I drive around it and I see the same things over and over again, but mm -hmm. I'll drive for like 15, 20 minutes just driving around town driving around the neighborhoods and stuff looking at all of this stuff every single solitary day before i come back in and start my my day why do i do that because it's just cool it's like it's what i enjoy it's what i love it's what i do but it's also like it's like ooh, look i've seen the same building every single day for 365 days a year but Every single day, it looks different to me. Every single day, there's something that I notice that is slightly different or slightly more just exciting. And how how could I like? It's literally like how could I? I'm 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 smitten, dude. I mean, like, there's, there's literally like <laughs> I can't I can't even express my feelings, my true feelings right now. <laughs> it, it it really is. It's like I love this profession. I mean. As much as I get frustrated on the daily for things yeah. and you don't even want to hear one of the requests that I got today, which oh, would have literally broken many a people. And in fact, when we heard this request, uh, it broke a few people and they're like, some of the four letter words that were thrown about were just like, that's it. And all of this other stuff. And. I was just like, okay, yeah, I mean, uh, it sucks and all, but I'm coming back the next day for more abuse. <laughs> you know, and the next day. And the you next you day, got me all up the there, day. and now you're bringing me back down. I <laughs> well, I mean, think about this. Every time you and I get together, what do we do? We like... We look at buildings. We look at buildings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we look at great architecture. Ooh, yeah. I, I was actually just thinking about that when you were when you were waxing poetic again about about architecture. And I'm thinking we're about a little over four months away from the AIA conference right, yep. in DC. And I'm thinking, man, maybe we should uh, we should plan a a meetup and a a sketch walk or something, yeah, and just absolutely do this because in person. Fortunately, we won't be going to the Glenstone. Be Why? Because I just uh, received an article or an email because I'm on their mailing list that 
the pavilions, the um, Pfeiffer pavilions, are going to be closed for a year, starting in March. So <laughs> that, that hurts. That hurts me right here. Yeah. So, I mean, it's well, not to say that we couldn't go to it and walk the grounds and go see the Guathami. View, view, gaze just, upon it. Yeah. <laughs> you can gaze <laughs> past it, but you won't be able to go in there. Um, Jeez. However. Well, there's a lot of other stuff to look oh, at. I think DC of... is really where I've really, I mean, we've talked about this many years ago on the podcast, but that was the first place where I really felt like architecture did something to me it, it's the, that yeah. place to me yeah. yeah the thing that i find so amazing about the mid-atlantic region is and there's obviously other regions within the u.s and heaven forbid we start talking about outside of our borders but is that you can see the gamut of our architectural history from before we were who we are to this very day and see every single solitary bit of our architectural evolution. And it's so mm -hmm. exciting to be able to see that, to be able to see something from mid-century sitting right next to a pre-colonial, sitting next to cutting edge modern technology, using the latest tools and using the latest construction methods and things like that. I mean, there's this building and I can't recall exactly what it is, but I know exactly where it's at in DC and I will show you when we get there that is using this glass and we've all heard of like flow glass and stuff, but this glass is like bubbled out and bowed in and it's like this warped plane and it's every one of them are uniform and it's such a, an amazing, like the glass itself, which is typically just this like flat plane and we kind of like do weird things to kind of facet it and just kind of like make something exciting out of it. It is the most exciting part of the facade is mm. the glass, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, and, and it's just, it's, you'll see, you'll see. <laughs> cool. Cool. Well, I, I would be interested to hear what our listener community thinks about this idea. Would you be in for joining us on a, on a walking tour of architecture in DC. I mean, there's there's a, probably a lot of uh, variables that would have to line yeah. up for this to happen, but but if this is something that people would be interested in doing, I think we would be interested in in hosting such a thing. Yep, absolutely. And as somebody who used to live there for the past 14 years and will be there with a vehicle in hand, you know, we'll just... <laughs> How big is your bus? Ev Evan, <laughs> Evan is going to print out a, uh, a magnet um, an Arca speak magnet so that we can slap it to the side of the, uh, 12 passenger bus that <laughs> we will, uh, we'll rent. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and it'll be the Arca speak tour. That's right. Right. Well, all right. Let us know what you think. Uh, go to Arca com slash feedback and let us know what you think. That is where this question that we, we talked about today was submitted and we would love to get more of those because they give us things to talk about. And uh, I, I appreciate the the nature of the question, yeah. and so thanks to the listener who asked it, and, uh, and we'll be look keeping our eye out there for more. And part of that feedback, I would like to hear from some of our listeners: Would you do it all over again? Would you, mm. knowing the future of architecture includes AI, would you do it all over again? Good question. I bet we're going to hear a lot of different answers. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, let us know about the, the DC stuff, people, community, ARCA speakers, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you next time.